So here we are again at Le Meridian. Uh, we've been thinking a lot about how it would feel when we got back here. Uh, since uh, the last time we were here, there were bullets flying all, all over the place, and uh, you can see explosions out over the city and can hear it and can feel it here. Uh, strangely for me, it, it actually feels uh, even uh, calmer and more safe here than other times I've been here. And, and maybe for me it was, it's because uh, uh, being so close to what happened last time, now everything feels far away that if something happens, you know, you know we'll find out about it and it, it, just don't figure that it'll be as close as it got this last time. What I, what I keep feeling is sort of, sort of like a deja vu, but it's actually happening. So we were just downstairs eating lunch and they started moving all of the tables outside like they did the night before, you know, mm -hmm. with the wine and cheese story right before the attack on the hotel. Um, or that, you know, when we got our key, it was on the third floor. So right down here, it's on the same floor as where the footage um, of the actual fighting and when we got attacked was on this floor um, and all of the same people. So it seems familiar. As we were flying out on the French military plane that evacuated us, uh, I know that we were already both, both of us thinking we have to return, which uh, for most people, especially our family, uh, it was a little bit difficult to hear. But um, one thing that we've kept on saying is how we were leaving the people that we came to see and the, the people that we were out here for trying to help uh, the, the refugees in, in worse conditions than they were before our trip. This city was also in worse conditions than than when he had left, so it just didn't feel right to, to be leaving. It felt really good because we were, we were safe, but uh, it's just amazing that uh, after all these years, it keeps on getting worse and worse and worse. I mean, like always, I want to get out of the capital as yeah. quickly as possible yeah. and um, get to the east and find out what, what the effects um, of the coup and, and the violence since then has had on the refugee population. This lobby was completely shut up, uh, all the windows broken. It looks very different right now than the way we left it. We could hear all the shooting outside uh, and, and around here, so bullets were going into the lobby. There was shooting out going from the lobby. Um, then, uh, then it got really loud and really close with the uh, parts of the wall and uh, I don't know what else falling on us. So. Yeah, that's where a bullet hit right there, just above us. That's when we were instructed to go into the dining room and then into the kitchen with the rest of the people. So this is the scene right here where um, we were crawling across the floor yeah. um, to reach the other people. Well, my name is Scott Warren and I am a senior at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. And this is uh, Colin. I, this is our second day in, in Njamena Chad. I'm Colin. Um, I go to Brown as well. Work with Scott a lot. I'm a year behind him and um, got involved in Darfur activism at the beginning of my freshman year at a group at Brown that I really liked a lot. Um, and, you know, really got involved in the issue, really invested in it. Um, and at the end of the year, I applied to work for a stand as well with Scott. Last year, I served as the National Student Director of STAND, which is the student division of the Genocide Intervention Network, and uh, the organization that's, that's helped to, to work and to mobilize thousands of students across the country on Darfur advocacy uh, and anti-genocide activism in general. Um, there are, at this point, I think, you know, over 800 college and, and high school chapters across the country, thousands of students working on this issue. We even have some chapters internationally. I guess I'm sort of trying to have as few expectations as I can because yeah. I know that I, there's no way I could have any clue, um, you know, which is, which says something in itself and that like, you know, there's all these people working back in the States and if you don't know what life is for the refugees that have been displaced for this conflict, that, you know, says a little bit about um, the issue. So, I mean, I think that's why this is, I act is so awesome is because it kind of should show people a little bit about what, what this really is and you know what you can kind of expect in a refugee camp. I I grew up all over the world um, and I lived a, a few years in high school in Nairobi, Kenya and sort of got interested in, in Africa through that and my dad worked in Sudan for a bit so I got interested in Sudan. 
Uh, and, I, and I interned in Congress during the summer of 2004. Uh, and during that summer is a summer in which uh, our Congress and our government made the unprecedented declaration of genocide in Sudan, which is the first time they've referred to ongoing atrocities uh, in, anywhere in the world as genocide. And so I got really interested then, um, but was, was sort of confused, actually, because it was the 10-year anniversary of Rwanda, and you know, I'd always heard never again from our politicians. And here were our politicians actually saying that genocide was going on and not really doing anything to, power, uh, to follow up that incredibly powerful rhetoric. Uh, so I, I, you know, I sort of thought, well, I could sit here and uh, decry the, the lack of action, uh, which I think is, is easy to do, or I could take action. And, and that's something that I think has been my overlying motivation throughout my Darfur activism is a belief that we can do more to stop genocide, a belief that we can do more to stop mass atrocities. Unlike Scott, I grew up in a small uh, suburban town in Massachusetts that was very wealthy, um, lived there my entire life. So uh, much different background from Scott, but when I got to Brown, like I said, I, I got involved in um, a group there. And I think one of the reasons actually that I wanted to stick with the issue is because the people that I was working with in this group, and I've seen this, you know, as I said, continue to work on Darfur issues with the high schoolers that I've worked with, um, are just so incredibly invested in this issue that people are so passionate about this and that so many people are willing to make those sacrifices as college students, as high school students. They're willing to skip parties, skip weekends, um, you know, put less time into their schoolwork for this issue that's thousands of miles away. My parents live in Zimbabwe now. And uh, you know, I told them they were going to chat. They're like, "Oh, that's cool. That'll be you know, a great opportunity for you to, to to see some refugees." And then a few weeks later, um, and my dad works for the State Department. And there's a magazine that comes out, and they had an article about the embassy <laughs> workers in uh, in the coup. And so my mom gets on the phone and she says, "So I'm reading this article." <laughs> and she's like, "You guys aren't spending any time in Jamaica, are you?" <laughs> so so here we are. You know, over the next few weeks. Uh, to actually go into the camps will be a completely different experience, but one that I think will be equally uh, invaluable for us to actually be able to meet the people that we've been working for for so many years. Um, and then hopefully, you know, we realize that we're just two of the thousands of students that have worked on this issue. So we hope that we can bring the stories of the refugees that we hear back to everybody else, uh, that we can use them to motivate everybody a little bit more, and that this can be uh, the start of more activism rather than sort of the culmination of everything that we've been doing. There were bullets hole oh. all over here. Like there's one you can see the yeah. all in here. The people that we have met in the camps before are still sitting in the same refugee camps. And I I truly believe that when we go out there in two days, they're going to say the same thing that they've said, which is, can you just do that last thing to make sure that there is protection enough for us to go home? Because even if the, the genocide and the violence in Sudan and the entire situation in Sudan wasn't completely peaceful, as long as there was protection, they would return home. Um, they want to rebuild their lives. They want to start doing that. And I'm still, I think every morning when I wake up and I kind of figure out what I'm going to do with my day, I'm still astonished by the fact that this is still continuing um, after five years in Darfur, but after all of the millions of people that have lost their lives. Um, and if they had protection, they wouldn't be in this situation. Yeah, the, those two words that you kept repeating are exactly the same words that you hear at any camp you go to from any group you sit down with, and it's uh, protection and hope. If, if they have protection, they'll go home. Um, they're not going to be able to get it on their own. Uh, we, we need to help, uh, and, uh, and uh, we need to do it now.